This episode is brought to you by DistroKid. With Amex Gold, you can experience the gold standard. You get access to exceptional dining, plus four times membership rewards points on eligible dining purchases. That's the powerful backing of American Express. Terms apply. Cap applies. Learn more at americanexpress.com slash with Amex. It's Throwback Thursday. Hey, happy Halloween, everybody. I'm Chris Fafalius, producer of Chris to Makes a Podcast, and welcome to another Throwback Thursday episode. Today, we're taking it back to Halloween of 2022, when Art Alexakis of Everclear joined the show to dive into the writing and recording of their hit song, Santa Monica. It's the perfect episode for the season, and if you enjoy it, we have a huge back catalog of episodes for you to explore. So go do that. Also, don't forget to sign up for our supporting cast at ChrisDemakes.com to help keep this show going and get weekly bonus episodes off the after party. But for now, let's jump right into this Halloween throwback episode with Art Alexakis. Enjoy. I am still living with your ghost. Lonely hey, everyone. Today's guest is Art Alexakis, lead vocalist and guitarist for the Portland, Oregon rock band, Everclear. Together, we take a deep dive into the writing, recording, and inspiration behind their breakout smash hit single, Santa Monica, taken from their 1995 album, Sparkle and Fade. Everclear's story is one of unbridled perseverance. Art had a vision for the band, and man, did he drive that home. He talked about being adamant with Capitol Records that he wouldn't sign with the label unless they gave him complete creative control. And by complete, I mean everything from the songs, the artwork, the image, all the way to him being the producer of their records. No stone was unturned, and by sticking to his guns, Art garnered the respect and attention from everyone at the label. He mentioned that he never records demos, as the chord arrangements and orchestrations of the song are already ingrained in his mind. No need to record them twice. And Art was thrown back a bit by my admission that he was the first rock star that I ever met in the flesh. True story. For all this and a whole lot more, don't touch that dial. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? podcast well hey art long time no see how are you hey man how you doing chris i'm doing great i you know i gotta tell you i was telling uh my producer chris you know you were the first rock star that that my band met you really were art just shot me a look like what let, let me explain so the only rock star you met then you haven't met a rock star yet <laughs> <laughs> no, I meant back in the day. You were the first one. And, uh, you know, our band's from Gainesville, Florida, and, and I saw everybody before they got signed. I saw the Boss Tones and Green Day and, and, and Helmet and you name it. Every band came and played the punk club, and they were all pulling up in their vans, and we were all kind of on the, uh, the same playing field. You know, they weren't on TV yet. And we got signed to Capitol not very long after you guys did. We got signed in November of 95. And it was probably maybe that fall or spring of 96. I just know Santa Monica, you were all over MTV. And uh, I was in Craig Aronson's office, our A&R person. And we're sitting in there talking to Craig. And you popped your head in like, oh, hey, what's up, guys? Just like some regular dude, you know? And it was like, we were just frozen, okay? It's like, we, you know, I had never met anybody that was on TV before. So you, you, were, the, you were the first rock star. Boy, but you, you must have been disappointed when you saw me in person. <laughs> oh, not at all. You're so much better looking than you are on TV. And guys, <laughs> I expect you to be taller. <laughs> No, in in fact, it it was you know you were revered around that building. I mean, you were just talked about so much, and I believe your A and R person was Perry Watts Russell. Perry was always talking art, 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 and you were just kind of bigger than life to us. And and it was really cool. And to finally get to meet you and hang out with you, and you were so down to earth, that meant a lot to us. Thank awesome. you. Well, you know, yeah, a couple of your guys came out and did a track look for me. Absolutely. <laughs> That was cool. Buddy, our trombone player, and our old sax player, Darren, came out and played on One Hit Wonder on So Much for the Afterglow. The 
and it was those two guys with the two two guys from a uh, uh, no doubt. Because that's the only horn players I knew. <laughs> so I called you guys. <laughs> I, think, I think Neil Avron, the producer, also played trumpet. Buddy was telling me the other day when I told him. He did play trumpet. He did play. Yeah. He scored it. Like, I sang what I wanted you guys to play. And and Neil Neil was our engineer. This is before he became Mr. Big Producer Guy. But he was our he was our engineer. He can read music unlike most of us. I I can't read music. <laughs> And he's like, you know, I sang it to him and re we recorded it and on keyboard and then he wrote it down and, and then he goes, you need another trumpet in here. Can I play? And I go, sure. Can you play? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it came out really good. Very Beatlesque, that song with the horns in it, for sure. It was cool. I love that song. And I got to tell you, I, I kept having these Everclear moments, okay? Our horn players got invited to play with you. I'm out one night. Our tour manager in between tours had a gig. He was the house guy, sound guy at the key club. And I'm there one night, and somehow I end up at a party with your former drummer who played on the song we're going to talk about today, uh, <laughs> Santa Monica. But I'm out with Greg Eklund one night. It's me and Greg and Matt and Andy Dick, of all people. And we, it was one of the most surreal, weirdest nights I've ever experienced in, in, in my life. <laughs> Is Andy still drinking at that time? He was still drinking at the time, yes. That's a different Andy. <laughs> He's just, yes. Yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, it was one of those uh, pinch me nights. I, I, I can't believe I'm in this business and how did I get here type thing. But yeah, kept kept having some some ever clear moments. But, uh, you know, your story's great, Art. You know, you, uh, throughout your 20s, I mean, you had bands, you were working tremendously hard and i know there was from reading your story and hearing there was some frustration finally you, you put together everclear you uh release world of noise on tim kerr records in 1993 out of portland and uh tell us about that time you were shopping around how did you get the deal with capital well the thing is so i moved to portland i was living in, in san francisco had my own record label at a band called Color Finger. Stupid name, good band. But uh, that was like late uh, 90 and uh, or in early 91, I met a girl in Portland. Three months later, she moved to San Francisco. And then three months later, she was pregnant. And so we couldn't afford to raise a kid in San Francisco. It's just ridiculous. So right. we moved to Portland where she had family there and my sister lived there, my mom went there all the time and my, one of my other sisters was thinking about moving so we have built-in babysitting right so i moved up there and i tried to do color finger long distance for a couple of months couldn't afford it and we were on welfare we were just broke and then i'm like okay i agreed with my i, I got my girlfriend to agree it's going to do one more band last band put an ad in with all my influences into this Northwest paper called the rocket, which was a big deal for a while. And, um, I got a bunch of like people responding to certain bands, but they didn't know other bands. And I got this kid from Spokane, Washington, who had just moved to Portland, Craig Montoya. And he is, yeah. and then this other guy who used to live in Scott Cuthbert, who used to live in, uh, Eastern Washington as well. And they come in and we, we, I give them a tape. We go to the studio and it's fucking horrible, just horrible. <laughs> and I'm like, oh man. And then I get a call from this guy from Seattle that he has this other guy and there's fans of Color Finger and I send them the tape and then I go up there, like I mail them the tape. And a week later, I get the money to get on a Greyhound bus and go up there. And it was amazing. They came down and we, we practiced once. And then they're like, look, either you got to move to Seattle or we got to move to Portland because we can't afford to do this. And I go, I can't afford to do this. So we walked away from it. And then I called Craig and Scott and we started slugging it out through the summer trying to get gigs. And it got better and better and better. And finally, I had a chance to record a four track demo. And uh, I traded some an old delay and an old reverb unit for... 40 hours of recording on quarter inch eight track and uh, we recorded every song we knew and i put it out as a demo tape sent it to south by southwest got accepted uh sent it to sent it to 
uh, new music seminar and all that, all the New York stuff got accepted. Went and played them at the same time before I left town. I sent it to every venue in the Northwest, every writer in the Northwest. I sent out like 30 tapes, borrowed all this money to do it. And by the time we got back, we had almost 70 messages on our phone machine of people writing about it, talking about it. Oh, wow. My girlfriend actually called me. Like when I called her, this is before cell phones. I had a pager, right? This is 90. <laughs> like a drug dealer. This is 93. <laughs> and she goes, you got to get home now. I go, I am. I'm, I'm driving home. She goes, no, you don't understand. Everybody in town is fucking talking about your band. Everybody in town is talking about World of Noise. She goes, what is World of Noise? That what you're calling that, that demo you made? I'm like, yes, I am. <laughs> I call it World of Noise jokingly because... There was so much feedback on that record <laughs> or two new tubes for my, uh, or six new tubes for my amp. So we'd have to like turn it off, let it cool off and then turn it back on and do a take. And then it'd start squealing again and blue lights would like shoot out of the back of it. We'd have to turn it off. And that's what it was. So that got us signed to, to a local record company called TK records. And then a year later, we got, you know, it just built up and built up. We did uh, CMJ Music Marathon. We did all that shit. You guys probably did all those shows. Sure, sure. We started getting offers in April of 94, the Capitol in 94. And that was right when Gary went to Capitol because he was still with Geffen. Yeah, he went there. And well, the best thing he ever did is he hired Perry Watts Russell, in my, mm -hmm. my opinion. But yeah, Gary really didn't give a shit about us till we started selling records. <laughs> that's how that's how it happens. Well, I got to jump in here. A couple things really surprise me. Okay, and and this isn't. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know your way around a studio. You're a, a a great producer now, and 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 you were at Sparkle and Fade. But how did anybody know that? Because World of Noise is is pretty raw, as you know. Great questions. That no one has ever asked me before. Thank you for asking. So. So dig this. So when we did a showcase in New York, it was a fucking nightmare. Um, I almost killed our drummer because he was a pot smoker and he forgot all the songs. And I told him, I said, <laughs> if you, you fuck up the LA showcase, I will fucking kill you. I will kill you. Literally. I had him <laughs> up against the wall. You, you remember me back in the day. I was in a good little fucker. I had him up against the wall, just like, I will kill you literally kill you if you fuck this up for me and for craig and he played great we got offers and you know how it was back then dude like we had like within two days we had 27 offers from major labels and i went and saw a bunch of them in la and in new york and then i said okay this is what i want i want this many records firm records not options you can have two options but i want four firm records including you put out world of noise not going to sell it to you. You can license it and put it out. And then we'll, then you got three firm after that, but firm, no getting out of it clause. They're like, okay, this much money. Okay. Touring support. You know, we're a punk rock band. So we, we want the touring support. We want them to buy us a band with a trailer, you know, the whole nine yards. And they're like, everything was cool. All the labels are like, okay, we're in. And I go, oh yeah, by the way, I have the total creative control on everything everything what do you mean everything everything and i produced my own records and, <laughs> and like poof <laughs> 20 labels gone they're just gone <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> but there's still seven labels there going okay what do you got and i'm like okay and then because of perry i love perry he was really it was no bullshit he wasn't trying to sell me he wasn't trying to gersh me as I, as I, as I called it, when you talked to Gersh, you know, he yeah. acted like he, he was your biggest fan and knew your mom and, you know, this and that, but Perry didn't make me feel like that. So I signed with it. We signed with him. So this is the deal. I have been to different studios all over the country. Um, I really love the sound of a lot of the indie stuff I had heard coming out of smart studios. And I called and talked to them. Not, not Butch. I didn't meet Butch till we were there and just negotiated with him. And then I got this guy who was 
a client of my then manager who had produced some punk rock bands and, or recorded some punk rock bands. I hired him to record. And then I was going to mix with this guy, Brian Maloof, who had done a lot of pop, but i had had a production deal with him, which was not a smart move, but we needed a little bit of money at the time earlier in the year. So he was going to mix it. And we drove up to Seattle, did the video for Fire Maple Song, which was the only single off of World of Noise. And then we drove cross country to, to uh, Smart Studios, which, as you know, is in Madison, Wisconsin. And mm -hmm. uh, I met Butch and we became friends. And after, after every day of recording, I would go up and play him stuff and we'd smoke cigars and he'd play me stuff from this project he was doing with this girl from Scotland that he had never met. She was in a band he never met. It was Shirley, right? And uh -huh. him and Duke and Steve and Shirley just doing this project thing that became garbage. And <laughs> um, yeah, it's really funny, right? But um, I, I remember when we had been on tour earlier, I had called, like, we, we were playing some little shithole plays in Madison, and I called and said, can I come by and look at the studio? And they go, if you come in before two, yeah. Me and Craig went there, and we looked in it, and we snapped stuff. We hit drums that were set up, and uh, I just, I dug the board. I dug everything about it, and I'm like, I want to record here. And um, so when we signed, that's where we did. And it was cheap, and we, remember back then, they gave you, like, funds, you know, like, mm -hmm. they give you 100, we had a $125,000 fund, which was pretty small at the time for a major label. And yeah. we, we spent 85 of it. And that's recording, mixing, recording a couple new songs, and then uh, mixing everything over again, remixing it, and mastering. And that was eighty-five grand. So the rest of the money, the other forty grand, we split three ways and and basically lived on. I feel pretty good right now because our deal was a hundred grand. You only got twenty-five grand more than we did. Yeah, and there's like <laughs> there's like eight more guys in your band. <laughs> I know, I know. Our money, our money didn't go as far. Art, at Jeez. least, at least um, you're not like the the boss owners where you got to pay a guy who fucking dances. They pay that. I know. Like a, yeah, they pay that guy like a band member, man. Exactly, exactly. Well, we're gonna jump into the track now, uh, real quick. Uh, before we do, uh, Sparkle and Fade, of course, was the second record, and since then, you've had seven more albums. The most recent being Black is the New Black in 2015, and and uh, yeah. congratulations, man. You're, you're you're still killing it, dude. We got a brand new song coming out um just finishing up the mix uh, i sent my second mix notes today we should be done either today or tomorrow super political song called year of the tiger and uh that's my new stuff man we want to record one or two songs a year i don't want to go in the studio for a year year and a half anymore that's just, it's no. not fun. It's fun the first few times, right? Now, nah, pe people digest music differently today, as you know. But uh, the song is three minutes and 11 seconds. The intro is six bars of a single guitar. And this simple one chord riff, man, it's the central key hook of the song, that pull off on that G chord. And on the seventh bar, verse one begins... I'm still living with your ghost Lonely and dreaming of the West Coast I don't want to be your downtown I don't want to be your stupid game With my big black boots and an old suitcase I do believe I'll find myself a new I'm still living with your ghost, lonely and dreaming of the West Coast. I don't want to be your downtime. I don't want to be your stupid game. With my big black boots and an old suitcase, I do believe I'll find myself a new place. I don't want to be the bad guy. I don't want to do your sleepwalk dance anymore. I just want to see some palm trees. I will try and shake away this disease. 
What's happening there? So I was living in Portland, you know, all the stuff's going on about, and just go backwards a little bit. In 84, I had gotten clean off of doing hard drugs, coke, heroin, stuff like that. And I started having reactions to it, like anxiety attacks, right? So anxiety and depression, because I've been medicating since I was eight years old. I started drinking when I was like young, young kid and started smoking pot when I was nine, shooting up when I was 13. So that's the backstory there. So I still suffer from anxiety. So in 95, we know our new record's coming out. I'm having anxiety attacks. I'm feeling kind of freaked out. And then uh, me and my my girlfriend, who was going to become my second wife that year, as a matter of fact, and our baby, Hannah, we went to the coast, the Oregon coast for the weekend. And the closer I got to the ocean, my anxiety just went away, just went away. Just, to, I don't know if it was psychological or physical or, or you know, whatever. It just went away. As we started driving back, it started coming back. And we had gotten signed in June. So this is after that. And after we put our daughter to bed, we I, I'd write like in the front room or out on the porch. So it wouldn't wake up my little girl. And then in the morning, the guys would come over and we'd go down to the basement, which we had taken money from Capitol and put, you know, foam and egg crates and shit like that, right? You know, like a little carpet <laughs> hanging down, old school. And yeah. um, I, so I remember writing those lyrics. I wanted to write a lyric about comfort zones and where you felt comfortable. And my comfort zone, in a lot of ways, was where I grew up, which is west side of LA, the coast, Santa Monica. I was born mm-hmm. in Santa Monica Hospital. Uh, Grew up in Santa Monica, Culver City. Um, The projects were in Culver City, Venice, when I got older, because that's where all the drug dealing and stuff was going on. And um, I wrote about comfort zones, not about Santa Monica. And when I finished the song, (laughs) I named it Santa Monica. And the label, especially Gary Gersh, lost their mind. They're going, no, you need to name this something else. Call it, what's the world die? People like that. That's edgy. That's alternative. All right. <laughs> no, that's not the song. The song is called Santa Monica. Sorry. Uh, creative Control, remember? You signed the contract. Ah. And he's like, look, I'm not asking you. I'm fucking telling you. You're going to do this. I go, you know, Gary, one, you need to calm down a little bit. Two, we, you doing this, I'm going to forget. All right. I'm good. They wanted me to say that I was 24 years old. They wanted me to lie about my age. Right? <laughs> and, and they wanted to call it watch the world die. This was the same argument. I'm like, look, man, you're trying to make me look like an asshole. And trust me, ask anybody who knows me. I don't need any help looking like an asshole. So politely, no, not going to do it. You want to drop yeah. me? I'll sue the fuck out of you. What do you want to do? And they put out the record and uh, to radio when they sent it to radio on those little mini CDs, it says mm-hmm. it says Santa Monica, watch the world die. I'm like, what? Uh, oh. <laughs> I'll tell you, you know, I, I I know you're not BSing me here because your reputation around that building, you were a bulldog, man. I'm telling you, there everybody said that, and you know what? Because of the way you were and because you had those written in your contract, creative control, you got respect from the get-go. Good for you. Well, I got respect from a lot of people, especially the rank and file in, in, in the building. You know, yeah, they, they, they knew if they had a problem, they called me. Because with most bands, you know, back then, you call most bands, you call their management, you don't get any response for days. Mine, right. everybody in every department have my phone number. You, you're not going to have to go through three different people. And I think... People love that, you know, because that was mm-hmm. not the norm at the time. And right. unlike, I just want to, I just want to say one thing about Santa Monica because we're talking about it and you're putting a spotlight on it. At the time, you know this. Most bands were signed in the '90s and still are for one for a hit song that they had that hit song. Right? We didn't have Santa Monica when we got signed. We were signed before I wrote Santa Monica. Hard Spark Dollar Sign was a color finger song that we redid. So I had that, but they hadn't even heard it. That wasn't on any demo. So that didn't get assigned. And that was our that was huh. our third song. So we we didn't go about it the way that most people went about it back in the day. 
Yeah, no, it sounds sounds very unconventional. Well, I'm I'm presuming Art, this was recorded uh, sometime in '94, early '95. The record that this was uh, done to tape, not pro, uh, not yeah. Pro Tools. Two inch tape. It was recorded in August of '94, uh, and then we went back in the studio in L.A. Studio B at uh, what was then called A and M Studios, and we recorded. Uh, it made me feel like a whore because funny. So we, we, we recorded Santa Monica. Like, so we wrote Santa Monica. Perry flew up, sat in our little dumpy basement, listened to all the songs, made notes, goes, yeah, that should be on the record. This sounds great. And then we played Santa Monica. And they're, he's like, wait a minute, play that again. And we played it again. And he's like, what's that called? And I go, Santa Monica. He goes, yeah, that's what it says here, but you didn't say Santa Monica. I go, yeah, but <laughs> let's, let's not go there. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, I think that song could be a hit. That, that's a pretty great song but it's not done yet and i go it's done you we're all like yeah it's done wait till you hear it recorded so we record it he listens to it he goes convinced it's one of the stronger songs on the record that it could be a really strong single but it's not done yet and i'm like wait till we mix it we mix it the first mixing he listens to it, he goes i'm convinced that this song is a hit single i would bet money on it this is a hit single but it's not done yet and then we <laughs> proceeded to get into a screaming match over the phone where we're using the F word prolifically <laughs> <laughs> at each other, like, fuck you, just really bad. Right? And then I'm like, all right, you know what? Fuck you, Perry. I'm going to do what you're asking me to do. I'm going to be a fucking whore. I'm going to be a slut, a your slut for you. Fuck you. And you know what? I'm going to write a song just for you. I'm going to write a song called You Make Me Feel Like a Whore. <laughs> and, and i just came up with off the top of my head and he's like well good, great and i hope it makes the record and i had something to do with it and, you know his poncy english accent yes and you know what i wrote a song called you make me feel like a whore which is a fan favorite and was our fourth single off that record our last <laughs> single off that record yeah, you know i need to clap you like a tree there is this place inside where I Thanks to Perry for pissing me off. Was he right? I don't know. I'll give him the credit all day long because we went in, we recorded another chorus on the end, put it on the end, and this is before Pro Tools. So we actually mm -hmm. recorded it to tape to another 24 track, another studer, right? We had two studers in the studio. And had to edit it together. Exactly. And just fucking cut the tape and put it right there. And then we recorded more guitars over it and that, that droning high lead guitar and yeah and more vocals and and gang vocals and stuff that just kind of takes it home and he's like it's done i will buy you a garden where your flowers can bloom i will buy you a new car perfect hey everybody we got to take a quick break for a word from our sponsors but we'll be right back with the second half of this conversation with art alexakis looking to elevate your music career DistroKid is a digital music distribution service that enables musicians to distribute their music to online stores and streaming platforms such as Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube Music, Amazon, Tidal, and many more. DistroKid collects earnings and payments, sending them to you, the artist. With DistroKid, artists unlock a world of possibilities. From easily paying collaborators with splits to securing your music with DistroLock, DistroKid covers all bases. Plus, you can promote your releases with HyperFollow and create eye-catching visuals with a Spotify Canvas generator, all for free. But that's not all. Introducing the DistroKid app, now available on iOS and Android. Artists can manage their releases, view streaming stats, and withdraw earnings, all from the palm of their hand. And for those looking to perfect their sound, check out Mixia. With its simple interface and customizable mastering options, artists can make their music sound polished and professional within minutes. And don't forget about Instant Share, DistroKid's newest feature. Share large files securely with collaborators, producers, and more, ensuring your music streams at the highest quality. 
Ready to take your music to the next level? Download the DistroKid app and explore their suite of tools today. Plus, listeners can enjoy 30% off their first year by visiting distrokid.com slash VIP slash Demakes. That's distrokid.com slash VIP slash Demakes. This episode is brought to you by Amazon. The holidays are here and you know what that means? It's time to get your friends and family the gifts they deserve. Take the stress out of shopping with Amazon's great deals and low prices on a huge range of items from toys to tech and much more. Whoever you're gifting for, Amazon has great prices on everything you need this holiday season. Shop early holiday deals now. With Uber Reserve, good things come to those who plan ahead. Family vacay? Reserve your ride as soon as you book your flights. To all the planners, now you can reserve your Uber ride up to 90 days in advance. See Uber app for details. Oh, it's such a clutch off-season pickup, Dave. I was worried we'd bring back the same team. I meant those blackout motorized shades. Blinds.com made it crazy affordable to replace our old blinds. Hard to install? No, it's easy. I installed these and then got some from my mom. She talked to a design consultant for free and scheduled a professional measure and install. Hall of Fame son. They're the number one online retailer of custom window coverings in the world. Blinds.com is the GOAT. Shop Blinds.com right now and get up to 40% off select styles. Rules and restrictions may apply. Time to move? Skip the hassles of selling during the holiday season and sell your home directly to Open Door. Request an all-cash offer in minutes, close, and get paid in days. You can even pick your close date so you can move after New Year's. Start your move at opendoor.com or download the Open Door app. Open Door is represented by Open Door Brokerage Inc., license 02061130 in California, and Open Door Brokerage LLC in its other markets. Terms and conditions apply. Do you enjoy the content and production of Krista Makes a Podcast? Do you have an idea for a podcast or an existing podcast that you'd like to take to the next level? Well, check out WeKnowPodcasting.com. At WeKnowPodcasting.com, we have over 25 years of combined experience in the pod field, and we're ready to help you succeed in the golden era of podcasting. And now, back to the show. We get uh, harmonies on the word downtime. I don't want to be your stupid game, bad guy. And the last three lines, I don't want to do your sleepwalk dance anymore. I just want to see some palm trees. There's a harmony on palm trees. And the whole line, I will try and shake away this disease. The harmonies are subtle. After a stupid game, the guitar chords ring out, and there's an arpeggiated guitar panned off to the right that takes us into the second half of verse one. With my big black boots and an old suitcase. That's when the stereo guitars come in, but they're not the big stereos yet, but it, it, it's kind of subtle. Also, single hits on a closed hi-hat. On the line, uh, Sleepwalk Dance Anymore, the drums and the bass come in. It's, um, again, really subtle, kind of single notes on the bass. A cool overdub guitar is panned off left that happens here. Uh, I'm calling it the, the taxi guitar. It's like a, a, a horn goes by. It's, it's one of those. What exactly was that? So basically, that's an old school rock thing where you leave one pickup open, the, the other pickups turned off, right? And then you toggle between it as you hit the chord. And I was bending the string as I was toggling it. I did it in the studio as a joke during that lead. And and everybody started laughing. But it was pretty fucking perfect. I go, let me hear that back. And I go, this is in smart studios. So I go, that sounds pretty awesome. And everyone's like, no, that's totally cool. And I remember when we played Santa Monica, later that summer, we played Santa Monica Civic which was a big deal for me to play. We sold it. Oh, yeah. Pacific. And a drummer from a fucking big, big band that was like the hip band, they signed it, Interscope. He came with his wife, and and they're like, yeah, we just really love that little guitar riff you throw. That's the whole thing. That's why we came. I'm like, okay, thanks. <laughs> it's such a little hook in this song. As I said at the top, too, just that, that guitar riff, the, the pull-off in this song, that, that's a hook. And it's, it's so simple, but it's, like it, it's, the, it's such a big part of this song. On the last line here, the band stops again. The guitar chords ring out uh, as a now very audible bass guitar does a tasty little run into chorus one. 
We could live beside the ocean Leave the fire behind Swim out past the breaker Watch the world die We can live beside the ocean Leave the fire behind Swim out past the breaker Watch the world die We can live beside the ocean, leave the fire behind, swim out past the breakers, watch the world die. We can live beside the ocean, leave the fire behind, swim out past the breakers, watch the world die. It's a double chorus right off the uh, off the bat here. And do you recall the demo? Did you do you have a demo with this? I looked on YouTube. I could not find one. I never did demos. You never did demos. You're one of songs, you're one of those guys. The songs you heard <laughs> as demos were originally recorded to be as a single or something else and then i when we had a bigger budget i went back and recorded it but we don't do demos we've never done demos ever was the arrangement pretty much the same except when perry heard it later and he wanted to double that course at the end was yeah. it, what we're hearing up to this point's the same yeah everything was recorded like you heard it that's why we had to go back in and we recorded the third chorus on to another studer and then we took that tape and actually taped it onto the end of it and then recorded more stuff over it but there was no demo there was no pro tools there was no auto tune yeah and i and i can hear it in the performance because there's the stuff isn't the backing vocals aren't perfectly lined up it gives that push and pull uh, it's not all pretty and that that's that's another part that i think is uh you know, makes makes this song stand out. You can tell it's not uh, it's not sterile at all. Chorus one here, you get another pair of stereo guitars that come in. They're a little bit bigger than what's in the verses. The bass and the drums are in. The vocal harmonies again. They're subtle here in the chorus. The song doesn't really get too much bigger here than from what's going on in the verses. I noticed on the second time you say we can live beside the ocean, there's no harmony there at all. Thought that was interesting. How'd that come about? Do you remember playing around with the harmonies in the studios? Because again, you're the producer, so there's no one there really telling you what to do. How, how, how did that all come up, come together? I like the fact that it went from bigger to smaller and more intimate. But to be honest with you, that was the afterthought. It's just that vocal, for whatever reason, we couldn't get it on on tune. And I was saying almost all the backups on Sparkle and Fade. The other guys sang on the next record a lot. Mm -hmm. I made them. I got them vocal coaches. That's what we did on that. And they sang on the fourth record as well. But it just didn't sound as good with the harmony on it. So I took it off. Interesting. So it was there. Originally, yeah. And uh, again, this chorus, I'm calling it a double chorus because the lyric happens twice. And on the last line, watch the world die. There's a six bar reintro, just like the top of the song that takes us into verse two. I am still dreaming of your face. still dreaming of your face hungry and hollow for all the things you took away i don't want to be your good time i don't want to be your fallback crutch anymore walk right out into a brand new day insane and rising in my own weird way i don't want to be the bad guy i don't want to do your sleepwalk dance anymore i just want to feel some sunshine i just want to find some place to be alone it's about comfort zones it's about it's about going through relationships it wasn't about one specific relationship. It, this isn't an autobiographical song, but in a sense it was because it's things I had experienced and then made an amalgam of a character uh, in the first person. And I like to write from the first person because I like storytelling. I like storytellers. My favorite writers or songwriters are from the first person. And going all you know back to 
Elvis Costello, Springsteen, Tom Petty, even like a Rolling Stone by Bob Dylan, you know, that it was just like you were part of this visceral, intense, present conversation. And I found that really exciting. So I tend to do that a lot in my songs, but it makes people think that everything's autobiographical, which I'd say about 30% of my songs are. I think another 30%, another third are like Santa Monica, where I take amalgams and, and I, I create composites of characters from different things that happen in my life and maybe some writer artistic license. And then another, the other 30% are just songs I just make up. You know, I just write. And it's like, yeah. there's a song on Sparkle and Fade called Queen of the Air. And I remember playing that song for the guys in the band. And they're like, man, that's rough. They said that she, she just disappeared. They said I look just like her. Greg Eckman was like, I'm really sorry about your mom. I go, why? He goes, well, your mom jumped off a bridge, right? I go, my mom wasn't Beaverton, man. <laughs> my mom. <laughs> no. I saw, I seen this book called Virginia, Queen of the Airlines that was in this vintage bookstore because I dig vintage books. and But it was never open when I would walk by there because we'd go into a breakfast place on Sundays and it was never open. Finally, after I write and record the song, put the record out, I went and saw that book. And it was some stupid book, like a young adult book from the early 1910s or 19 teens about this girl, Virginia, who leaves home and runs away to go ballooning across America, you know, <laughs> <laughs> in like big balloons. But uh, I just wrote the song about, I don't know, just thinking about. What it would be like to find out something about your past without knowing about it your whole life and knowing yeah. it from one perspective and then learning about it from a, from the real perspective. I love hearing stories like that because, you know, there's only so many words in, in well, English language of, of how I write uh, that you can use to describe, have descriptors in a song. And it's it's stories like you're talking about that you pull from that, like, no one else is going to do the book from 1915, you know, and you did it. And that's that's what makes uh, what makes songwriting interesting. You never you never know where an idea is going to come from. This verse is interesting because all of a sudden now, you know, usually in, in choruses art, that's where the song really lifts and gets really big. The song's huge now in verse two. Those those another pair of stereo guitars come in and they're kind of nasty. There's some top end on these and they're just full of fuzz. And uh, they come in right after a squeal of feedback off of the chorus. After the line, I don't want to be your fallback crutch anymore. Uh, there's one or two guitars that does like a string bending wail for a second there. You get harmonies on face in the first line, good time in the third line. The line I just mentioned, I don't want to be your fallback crutch anymore. You get harmonies on bad guy. I don't want to do your sleepwalk dance anymore, sunshine. And then the last line of verse two, I just want to find some place to be alone. After bad guy, again, there's some cool feedback panned off left. This whole time, there's this string bendy guitar sporadically happening, kind of panning now to the right and the left that's coming in there that just kind of adds some really cool ambience. And the last line, I just want to find some place to be alone. There's this little guitar solo run that happens there before we go into, into chorus two. I'm assuming all these things are starting to happen because you're wanting the song to build. But, you know, I've heard this song a million times until I put it under the microscope. And I'm like, my God, look how big verse two is. This is like the heaviest part of the song right now. And what was the thinking behind that? It's, it's definitely different. Well, one of the things that, I like to do, I love feedback, even though there was way too much in a world of noise, listening to it now, it doesn't <laughs> sound like too much, right? I just, I love controlled feedback. I even like uncontrolled squeal, like, you know, that whole thing of like going into the second verse is like, if you're playing live clean, right? And then the third one, you just, you, you hit into your distortion box and you just basically slide your volume all the way up and it just goes, eh, 
right right before you go in it's just that sounds real to me that sounds like a real rock band when you're playing yeah. when you're playing guitar and that's what i wanted it to sound like and that's what it did and we still do that if you listen going into the next chorus like after that third verse and there's that roll you know there's mm -hmm. that, that big drum roll before we do yeah. lift beside the ocean you hear me hear that hit that guitar there's actually three guitars i'm hitting a three part guitar harmony of just that one like because i hit that yeah. in the studio you know like on the on like one of the takes and then i'm like you know what fuck i should let's hear let's hear what a, a harmony it sound i think i hit a fifth and then i hit a third to give it that kind of car horn you know kind of just eh, yeah. car horn sound and I throw a third in there as well. So it's a first, third, and a fifth, which if you know music theory, you're not supposed to do that. But <laughs> hey, it works. It worked. It worked here. Who mixed the record art? This guy by the name of Brian Maloof, who had done a lot of pop stuff in the late 80s, early 90s. I heard you mention him a moment ago. And I'm again, I'm marveling. I know you have creative control, but. A, why this guy? And B, again, was there any resistance from the label? I mean, think of all the big mixers. You had your Andy Wallace's and all these guys the Lord back Algies. in the 90s. The Lord Algies, right. How did you convince them to go with this guy? Again, uh, this is it, it's, I marvel at this. It's amazing to me. Well, they didn't have a choice, <laughs> for one thing. They didn't have a choice. <laughs> and I didn't have a choice because in like probably three, four months before we got signed, my manager and this girl that was like helping him co-manage a little bit had brought Brian Maloof to us and he wanted to produce a couple of songs and then shop them. But we had to sign a production deal with him. And if we didn't get signed within six months, the production deal went away. And um, we did the demos, but they weren't great. The, the labels didn't really like them, but it was less than six months when we got signed. So I had to honor that or buy him out for a lot of money. And I'm just like, okay. So he got to mix that record. Plus he was a friend of mine at the time. And I'm yeah. like, okay, that's cool. But, you know, I knew I was going to push him and push him till it sounded the way it needed to sound. And it did. But he brought he brought something to the table for sure. And you you never know. I, I I doubt this, but there's a chance if you would have got one of those big mixers that it wouldn't have been the same record and the magic wouldn't have happened. Maybe. But the next record was mixed by when we first recorded it and mixed it with Brian because we were close. It wasn't very good. Even Perry goes, it's okay, but it's not going to do mm -hmm. what you want it to do and you can do better. And I... We went through all the songs, pulled some songs out, wrote some new songs, and wrote all these mix notes to do all the stuff to the, the songs and said, we're going to use a mixer, and I want to use Andy Wallace. He was like, I've already called him. He'll do it. <laughs> well, it's a different sounding record. That was so much for the afterglow. That took it up like three levels, just what he brought oh, yeah. to the table for sure. Now, that, that record still sounds incredible. It sounds awesome. Well, Chorus 2 is basically a, a double of the first chorus. So you're, you're getting uh, all the lyrics four times. And you know, I wrote here that you could tell this is pre-Pro Tools. The backing vocals have a loose feel. Nothing's copied and pasted here. You know, there, there, there's some rub, but that just makes it feel real and natural. Almost halfway through here on Leave the Fire Behind, and I'm behind, we get a harmony. The vocal melody changes on this line there. And I just, I love those little things. They just grab me when those happen. I love how you, you change the melody there. Yeah, we just take it up. It's more exciting, you know? The, the yeah. song's building, so I need to go to a higher range. I don't even think it's a conscious thing. It's like when you're writing and it's, and you know, it's starting to kick in and you're going into the, the second and third choruses. You want to take it higher if, if you have the ability to. And at that time, I could. Yeah, watch the world 
the lead vocal goes up an octave as your vocal gets really, really intense. And there's harmonies on everything here. And uh, that lead guitar, again, is sporadically doing these little runs and other cool noises here on the back half. It just keeps kind of building. That's what we actually recorded and cut and actually literally pasted. That's the one we did. I'm doing one guitar where there, there is some like harmonizing guitars and little, 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 little mm-hmm. you know, yeah. that stuff going on. But there's also this high guitar where I'm just like, ding, 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 ding. Yes. Just drawing. And then at the end of it, there's a second one where it comes up and does a harmony on it. That's kind of low, but it's in there and just, just droning. And, but that kind of stuff is exciting to me that those high. Yeah. And then harmonies on everything. I sing high over the, the chorus that was there before where I'm singing more in my normal register and sang an octave and a high fifth and um, recorded those harmonies as well. And I think Greg didn't sing on that for sure, but I think Craig might have sang on like a couple of those harmonies with me. Something I never noticed until, again, I'm putting it under the microscope. I, you know, I've heard this song how many times, but I'm like, wow, it goes up an octave here. That's what just, it just totally sails this part. It just lifts so, so much. And it almost sounds now because you pasted this and you were kind of having an issue with your, you know, Perry, your A&R guy about this, it almost sounds like, you know, there's some frustration in your voice. Like, I'm going to go up an octave and scream this part out. Not really. I Once I agree to do something, I'm 100% in, you know, because half-ass shit doesn't get you anywhere. You know that. No. It's just like, you've got to be, you've got to be committed. And if you're, you're going to agree to try something, you better try it. My wife wants me to go to some concert that I really don't want to go to. But if I agree to it, I'm all in. And I'm going to try to find, instead of going to pick it apart, I'm going to find good things about it. Because that's, that's, awesome. that's the only way you can live with yourself. That, that's the only way you can find joy in this world. Otherwise, you're just looking for the bottom to fall out of everything. So, no, I was I was totally into it. But there's a lot of angst in that song. I mean, especially yeah. at the end where you're going on and you're and I'm screaming, watch the world die. I mean, yeah, you know, that's, <laughs> no, that, know. that's all about, there was a movement of writing and art in the late 1800s of the intelligentsia, early 1900s called the romantic period. And the, the American new romantics, it started with like Herman Melville and Edgar Allan Poe and then, and, mm-hmm. and Walt Whitman one of my favorite writers of all time, Walt Whitman, and and went into the late 1800s, early 1900s. And I just took that to a very punk rock place of like, fuck the world, man. When all is said and done, you and me can go somewhere. And, you know, in Santa Monica, I remember at night swimming out past the breakers and it's kind of scary out there in the dark, right? Because there's Jaws is probably right underneath you right because <laughs> yeah. once that movie happened it freaked everybody out but <laughs> yeah and it was filmed out there too so <laughs> well no that was filmed in uh in, in, in the east coast but um oh was it yeah, okay that was, that was filmed filmed in uh martha's vineyard but you know that, that just that just romantic thing like as long as you and me can have a kiss as the nuclear bombs roll into us and the world's dying fuck it I got to tell you, what what a more perfect lyric. Think about what was going on in the 90s, that angstiness. Everyone wanted to be, I, I guess that's the only word I can think of right now, angsty. You know, and that 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 word just, that lyric just sums it up. Watch the world die. But question for you, was there any input from Perry or anybody else saying, hey, there's got to be some more information here because you, you're, the chorus has never changed from those lyrics. Or that's what it was. Perry never tried to change my lyrics ever. He asked about a couple of things, but not on that song. And he was my biggest defender when they were trying to get me to change the title of it. He goes, I understand where they're coming from, but you call it, it's your song, call it what you want. I go, yeah. it's called Santa Monica. I wanted to write a song called Santa Monica. And this was the song I wanted to write. And um, I'm very proud of that song. I'm very proud that, that there's a picture somewhere. I don't have it, but... There is a picture from the next year, 96, somewhere in 96, we play the Santa Monica Civic. We had offers to play everywhere, the the Palladium, the Greek Theater, everywhere in L.A. 
and I picked not the biggest offer from Santa Monica Civic and not the least good sounding place. That's a horrible sounding thing. Mm -hmm. But I didn't give a shit because I wanted to drive up and see it say Everclear sold out Santa Monica Civic. And I got a picture of that somewhere. And I wish I had it. And just the hype of it, you know, just your memories from there. The singles called Santa Monica. You're playing there and there's people wrapped around the block trying to get in. There's the hype. That's 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 awesome. I remember my management calling me and going, man, you need to come over and look at this guest list. I go, well, just send it to the hotel. And she's like, my management assistant's like, no, it it's like the Dead Sea Scroll. I'm like, what? <laughs> okay, so I go by there. You know, I, I swing by the, I'm in LA, I swing by there and she takes this thing and just throws it out on the ground. It just rolls out because there's all these people want to come to the show. And there's famous people on there. I'm like, yes, yes. Her? Yes. You know, and then <laughs> there's these names and I'm like, who the fuck are these people? And then there's this one guy, Ray Goldman. I'm like, who, the, who is Ray Goldman? I sounds familiar. And then I remember. Ray Goldman was the guy that was fucking my girlfriend when I got busted for buying <laughs> acid and I spent three days in the, in jail and he was fucking my girlfriend. My first girlfriend, <laughs> love of my life. Did you did you leave him on tell the guest list? Guy, just, tell that guy to meet us somewhere. Tell him you can put him on the guest list and that you want to see him and we'll kick the shit. <laughs> I'm like, nope. Didn't put him on the guest list. Nope. No Ray Goldman. Well, a couple no things. No Ray we're, Goldman. <laughs> we're going to get into the outro here, about to wrap up, but there's no bridge in this song. Doesn't need it. There's no bridge. There's no bridge. No. No, there's a, there's re, there's a re-intro, which is kind of like a bridge. The intro, the re-intro, the outro, all the same thing, really, except for the, on yeah. the outro, it's just watch the world die. That's That's all we're saying there. And yep. then I have the guitar swoops going the around the room, you know, that kind of stuff. Exactly. Well, uh, we're going to get to that right now. So the lyric is, yeah, watch the world die. And it happens four times. On the last line, Art, it's just you by yourself. There's no harmony, but there's harmonies on the other three lines. And in between, there's that round, that guitar thing that's happening. So you say, yeah, watch the world die. There's the rear on the guitar. And you say, yeah. Uh, just a single vocal. Yeah, watch the world die. The guitar squeal again. And you you say, whoa, watch the world die with that guitar rear again. And then the last line, by yourself, no harmony. And the whole band ends on that major G chord. And the song comes to an end. The guitar is sustained out. And then mm -hmm. we hit on the crash. And then the bass goes down. It just goes down. Yeah, watch the world die. What did you think when you heard the record back? Where did this song sit with you? Did did you think it was a single? Did what what were your thoughts when you heard heard the final mix back? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I knew it was on the radio. I knew on the, on this record. I knew this was like the big song. You know, this was going to be the big song off the record. Everybody knew that. It was pretty obvious. But like I said, we didn't get signed for it. So prepare. Yeah. Like, thank you, God. He's like, because he like wanted us to develop. He thought we would hit on our second or third record, you know, yeah. of major level records. And that was a thing that happened back then. You got, you got, it was called developmental deals and they would, they would work you up. You'd sell a hundred thousand, the first record, a quarter million, the second record. And, and uh, those, those days are, are long over, as you know. Well, they were over then, to be honest with you, Chris, they weren't really developing bands like that. I mean, I think, I think, so you were signed under Gersh or were you signed under Roy? Um, I mean, it was Gersh. Roy came uh, during our third record. There, you got signed in '95, so you, you were you were signed like that summer of '95. We put out our record in May of '95. Mm -hmm. I remember Gersh did this thing where he went everywhere to like our our distribution at the time, which was called SEMA Capital. Yes, uh, yes, that that was the distribution, and he was like meeting and talking in front of like all these people and everyone's talking about uh new signings i think he was talking about you guys he was talking about triple fast action talking about the smoking popes but he's talking about all these bands but every like friends of mine that worked in in, in marketing were like 
every meeting, people would get up and ask questions. Every meeting, someone's like, well, what's going on with the Everclear record? How come we're not getting more money and more emphasis from you guys about this record? This is a phenomenal record. We're getting people calling about this record. Record stores are calling. They, they can't keep it on the shelves, but you're not letting us distribute more. And he's like, well, Everclear is kind of a developmental thing. And several people, I'm told, like, no, this is a record that's ready to break now. And he's still, it's like when we did the bit, the the budget for uh, our first video for Heroin Girl, apparently, so Sam Bayer, who, who did uh, Teen Spirit, the mm -hmm. director, wanted to do Heroin Girl. And he was going to get John Doe from X and Claire Danes and all these famous people. And the budget was 85 grand, which really wasn't that much for a video at that time. Not back then. <laughs> But so anyway, he wouldn't give money for it. Give us 30 grand for Santa Monica. He gave us 85 grand and we made it with this guy who had never done a real huge video, but for whatever reason, the perfect storm of what was going on at radio, what was happening in the video, it just connected that it blew up. It went to remember buzz bin and, Oh, of course. Yeah. Did, did Mark, did Mark core do the video? Mark core didn't do this video. Mark core did, uh, you make me feel like a whore. And then me and Mark core did the video for everything to everyone. We co-directed. I knew that you, you did one with him. We did one with him. I think he did basket case by green day. Mark, Mark was kind of hot back then, but uh, he was such a great guy. He was, he was, he was awesome. Yeah. He was no BS man. He just grabbed the camera and start running right with you. If you're running, you know I mean? He was, he was, he was, he was super cool. Before we wrap up art, is there anything you'd like to leave the listeners with what you have going on? I mean, you've been doing the Summerland tour since 2012. It goes out almost every year. Uh, it's kind of a, a nineties throwback tour. That's just doing fantastic for you. Anything else going on? Well, this year was our 30th anniversary. And, uh, I found like I'm in my studio storage place and me and Freddie, our bass player found tapes in the back that were, uh, the original mixtapes for world of noise so we remastered them and it's on digital platforms out in vinyl uh early next year got a new song called year of the tiger that should be hitting you know itunes and and uh, youtube and stuff like that in the next month and other than that we're just touring a lot and just having a great time and just grateful just you know doing my my sober fellowship i'm Sober 33 years. I got diagnosed with uh, multiple sclerosis six years ago. And you know what? I'm just very grateful to have my family, my wife, my daughter just started high school. All the guys are doing well. Freddie had a baby a couple of years ago. Davey's baby, baby. He's like six foot three. <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's a junior in high school. We're all doing really, really good. We're enjoying playing and we're looking forward to just playing next year as much as we can and keep do do this as long as God and the universe let us do it. You know? Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for sitting. It was great to catch up with you. All right. Thank you. Hey, everybody. I hope you all enjoyed that conversation with Art Alexakis. I thought that was an awesome one, but don't, go anywhere we have a few words from our sponsors and we'll be right back with lots more chris makes a podcast whether you're making a delicious family meal or a post-workout snack choose the farm fresh taste of eggland's best eggs only eggland's best hens are fed their proprietary all vegetarian feed that's what makes their eggs more nutritious with 10 times more vitamin e 25 percent less saturated fat and six times more vitamin d compared to ordinary eggs Egglands Best. Better taste, better nutrition, better eggs. Visit egglandsbest.com to learn more. 
The holiday season officially starts when you get that first card in the mail. Shutterfly makes it easy to add more meaning to the everyday with hundreds of holiday card designs that can be personalized in seconds with your favorite photos from this year. Select your greeting, customize the color, and even add little extras like personalized foil to make a holiday card that really shines. Enjoy 40% off with code SMILE40 at Shutterfly.com and send something meaningful this year. See site for more details. What makes a song a smash on the charts? Is it talent? Luck? Timing? Well, as chart analyst and pop critic Chris Melanfi would say, it's all that and more. Chris hosts Hit Parade, a podcast from Slate, where he tells tales from more than a half century of pop chart history. Through storytelling, trivia, and song snippets, he dissects how the artists you love or hate dominated the airwaves and shaped your memories forever. He's explained why Steely Dan is Yacht Rock and Jimmy Buffett isn't, why girl groups dominated the early 60s and boy bands the late 90s, how the members of disco band Chic wrote a bass line that launched hip-hop, how Taylor Swift pivoted from country to pop, how Sam Cooke invented soul, and James Brown invented funk, and what exactly a one-hit wonder is, and whether the band AHA is a one-hit wonder. I think you'd really like it. So for tales of the hits from coast to coast, make sure to follow Hit Parade wherever you get your podcasts. The Helping Friendly Podcast explores the music and fan experience of fish through interviews and deep dives on shows and tours. For more than 10 years, we've created insightful and fun discussions about our favorite band, and with the help of our guests and thematic series, we're still discovering new angles of appreciation for fish. And when the band is on tour, we provide a review of every show the following day. As one of our listeners said, any fish fans that enjoy meandering conversations and incredible insight on new and old fish shows, this is for you. Highly recommend. It's not just about the band and the shows, it's about the journey getting there. Throughout 2024, we're going to be running down the top 25 fish tours of all time, and that'll be interspersed with show reviews and regular episodes. Join us and check out the Helping Friendly Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, this is Dewey Halpas, host of Peer Pleasure on the Sound Talent Media Podcast Network. Join me each week as I explore another long-form conversation with one of your favorite musicians, actors, comedians, or creatives. From Chino Moreno of the Deftones, John Gorley of Portugal the Man, to Fat Mike from NoFX, and Ian Mackay from Fugazi and Minor Threat, we go all over the map. From Fall Out Boy to Slayer, Peer Pleasure has it all. Check us out now on Sound Talent Media. Hey, if you need a unique, thoughtful, and inexpensive gift for a friend or loved one, check out iloveenamelpins.com. Make someone's day by giving them a little present to show you care. Over 80 different pins are available, everything from cats and dogs to your favorite celebrities. And to top it off, you can use the discount code ChrisDemakes at checkout to save 30% on your order. iloveenamelpins.com. Give them something to wear that shows that you care. As we near the end of the show, here's a band you might not know. Welcome to this week's Band You Might Not Know. If you'd like your band to be considered for Chris to Makes a Podcast, all you have to do is email your best song via MP3 only and a short bio to band you might not know at gmail.com. This week's featured band is Big Cry Country from Washington, D.C. They're self-described energetic rock for the kind of people who think a cathartic cry can be improved by dancing. The band is made up of Roxanne Bublitz on vocals and guitar, Joe Miller on drums, J.P. Salasolia on guitar, and Jared Brennett on the bass. Here's a snippet of their song, Landlord's Paradise. The Rap with Chris and Chris. Man, I loved Art's backstory of how he believed in his music and put the work in to get people to hear it. I mean, that's like the the ultimate story 
of, I mean, that's pre-internet. It's not like he's posting his songs on the internet, like, hey, check out my songs. He is sending it out to everywhere and making sure everyone hears it. That's pretty inspiring. Yeah, he was pretty matter of fact. I mean, he, you know, even if he came off more, like, let's say he was bragging, um, I would take it in the sense that, like, he deserves it because the respect that that guy had, like I said in the episode, he he was revered around that Capitol building. You just heard, oh, Art is a badass. He's just, he doesn't take any crap. He 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 fights for what he wants, and uh, what, what a great success story. Speaking of fighting for what he wants, he got 27 different labels to have, like, are bidding on this band, and, you know, it, it narrowed it down once he said he insisted on having full creative control. That's so badass. Like, yeah, like you said, they, he was the producer of their first album. He's telling the major labels how it's going to be, and you're either along with him or you're not. Like, yeah, and I, once again, a badass story. I said to him, I said, no disrespect, but World of Noise doesn't sound that great. That record is just, it's raw. It's on a, like a $400 budget that they, you know, it was, it was a glorified demo, basically. You know, it, he admitted that. And to, to let this guy produce a record that's going to be on a major, because again, back then, you they were trying to get you with the big name producers and mixers of the day. Here he produces a record by himself, then he gets his buddy to mix it, and it, it, it blows up at radio. Like, who, who would have known? Yeah, and you mentioned demos in there, how that first album kind of sounded like demos. It's pretty crazy that Everclear doesn't record demos. And I was wondering, is it because they've played the song live so many times they've worked out all the kinks of the songs? Or is it just in the way Art believed so much in himself and his music that he also in his head has the whole thing mapped out like this is how it's going to be yeah i think he's one of those you know i i I'll use the Prince example where these just some of these guys just have it all mapped out. They just know. They know they're going to go in. They know what it's going to sound like. And they're not going to stop till they get they, they achieve the sound in their head. And I think that uh, that's what happened here. Yeah. I really liked when he said that if he agrees to do something, he's all in. Yeah. I really like that attitude. Like, if you agree to go watch this bad movie, well, you're going to try to find something good about it. <laughs> you know, like you're you're in for whatever that is. Once you agree to do it, I think that's a awesome attitude. I've never heard anybody say that. And I'm going to take that as my, my mantra going forward. I really, I really like that. That was really sound advice because how many times has someone been like, Hey man, I got free tickets to the Buffett concert. You're like, Oh, you know, yeah. and I, I've, I've been that guy and I don't want to be that guy. I want to go and go, you know what? The, the mandolin player was really good. <laughs> hey, perfect example. <laughs> perfect example for like this time of year is I had never seen the movie Hocus Pocus. It's like a kid's movie from the nineties okay. with like, Bette Midler and Sarah Jessica Parker. Uh, and I agreed to go watch it. A friend of ours was putting it on a big screen in her garage and I went and watched it and I watched it intently. Terrible movie, but I watched it and I paid attention the whole time and I, I tried to pick out things I liked about it, even though it was hard. So I like that attitude. <laughs> Chris, I thought it was cool. I was thinking, wow, you were recording this. I was thinking to myself, what's the first time I ever heard Everclear? And I don't know if you remember this, but I was able to Google it and find out. Do you remember in the 90s, there was a magazine. It was like a skinny magazine. It was called CMJ New Music Monthly. Of course. Absolutely. We played the CMJ New Music Seminar. So yes. What was so cool about that magazine is that it came with a CD in it. It came, yes. every issue had a comp CD in it, like a sampler. And I believe it was the first ever CMJ magazine I bought. June of 1995, the song Heroin Girl was on it from Everclear. Also on that CD, Hum, you know, Hum Stars was oh, on there. Oh, of course. Yeah. Uh, ben Lee, SNFU, and Thurston Moore were all on that one. And I was thinking about that summer, I was helping my pap, my pap delivered pop to stores and i remember i would buy that at this store called peachins when it came out every month and that's the first place i ever heard ben folds five first place i ever heard alanis morissette it was all that summer of 95 uh i don't know just just a random memory that popped into my head that's the first place i ever heard everclear even before yeah and, it, yeah, and cmj stood for college music journal right so it was distributed and service to all the colleges and man we had a we had a lot of of help from that that really got us uh 
uh, onto the college uh, radio stations. And when we would play certain colleges, man, we would notice that uh, people were tuning into the station. They were hearing our, hearing our music. It was great. That's so awesome. Do, were you guys ever on one of the CDs? I believe so. And I bet if I went in my bin of over 100 comp CDs <laughs> were on, I bet it's in there. I, I'm almost positive. I bet it is, too. I saw like a month or two after this Everclear one, there was one uh, Mighty Mighty Boston's. And the song that was on it was Hell of a Hat. I was like, hell of a hat. Really? <laughs> yeah. That's the song that's on there? Uh, yeah. Pick the B-side. <laughs> yeah. Chris, I also thought it was cool how Art insisted this song had to be called Santa Monica. I never thought about the fact that they don't say Santa Monica in it. And <laughs> yeah. also, I thought it was so cool that he was talking about like playing in Santa Monica, seeing their name on the marquee, having it be sold out. Uh, and it just made me think I can picture it. I don't know the venue or whatever, but I always, when I think about California, I always think about the Santa Monica Pier. Have you been on the Santa Monica Pier? Yes, I have. Yes. Yeah. Like a fancy mall there and stuff. That's where I saw that roller skating guy the one time. Yeah. The, the roller skating guy, Perry, whatever we were talking about the one time, yeah. Harry Perry. Uh, that's the first time I ever saw, experienced him was at the Santa Monica Pier. Uh, but, dude, great episode. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> I got to tell you, uh, I was texting with my buddy Mike, and we were texting about, like, football or something. And I said <laughs> I said to him, well, got to go. Got to talk to Art Alexakis right now. And he was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I sent him a screenshot of you guys talking. I thought that was pretty cool. Like you said, you said he was like a rock star. He is like a rock star, dude. People know who he is. Yeah, no, but he's he's so down to earth. And and from you know, as I said in the episode, that very first time he he ducked his head in the office of our A and R guy. We're standing. He's like, hey, what's up, guys? And it was just like blown away because this guy was all over TV. He was the first celebrity I, I, that I had seen on TV that I actually met in person. It was, it was really cool. And speaking of peeking your head in and saying hi to some rock stars, <laughs> if, if you want to listen to these rock stars, I mean, you and me, Chris, if you want to oh. hear us, if you want to hear us talk about more music stuff, all you got to do is go to ChrisDemakes.com and sign up for the Chris Demakes, a podcast supporting cast. We do a weekly podcast called The After Party. It's a lot of fun. We dive into sometimes it's stuff we talked about in the main episode. Sometimes we go off on a tangent, but it's always a great time. Heck yeah, Boston's had hell of a hat. We have hell of a segue. Thanks, Chris. Mm-hmm. That was awesome. <laughs> go to ChrisDemakes.com. We'd love to have you be a part of it. That'd be great. And please, if you haven't already, join the Chris Demakes a Podcast Facebook group. We'd love to have you. It is a ton of fun. And please give me a follow on Instagram at less than Chris D. I'd appreciate it. Want to thank this week's guest, Mr. Art Alexakis, for sitting in with us. And we'll see you next week. Do you like to laugh, geek out on music, and learn all about that band or artist who had that one song back in the day, but then seemed to fall off the face of the earth? If so, you need to subscribe to One Hit Thunder. Together with an array of interesting and hilarious guests, we do a weekly dive into One Hit Wonders like Eiffel 65's Blue, Krayshawn's Gucci Gucci, EMF's Unbelievable, Delamitri's Roll to Me, Los Del Rio's Macarena, Musical Youth's Pass to Duchy, and even Patrick Swayze's She's Like the Wind. So are you subscribed to One Hit Thunder or what? As Desiree would say, you gotta be. And as K7 would encourage, you gotta come baby come and join in on the fun of the One Hit Thunder podcast. One Hit Thunder is a podcast where we both celebrate and have a good laugh about bands and artists that had just one hit that we all know. Each week, we're joined by a guest from the world of music or comedy to learn more than you ever thought you would about some songs that you can't forget. And we decide if they brought the one-hit thunder or were nothing more than a one-hit blunder. Look, if you listen to the show, you're probably going to laugh, and I guarantee you're going to crush next time the bar has music trivia. Tag Team, Jane Child, Meredith Brooks, Looking Glass, Sean Mullins, Eiffel 65, EMF, Crash Test Dummies, Crazy Town, Chumbawamba. We have hundreds of episodes in our back catalog and a new episode each week. So pass the duchy, make sure you're connected, and subscribe to One Hit Thunder wherever you get your pods. Hey everyone, it's Chris Pandolfi inviting you to check out the new season of my podcast, Inside the Musician's Brain, with new episodes airing now. Hearing it in that room, these guys playing this thing and trying to figure out how to play this song was mind-blowing. It's so inspiring to know there's so much more to it than you ever thought, and it just opened another door. But when people find faith because they need to, in terms of just filling a void to feel better without actually being better, that's when it becomes 
a crutch, much like you know, drugs and alcohol do. Man, I don't have all the time in the world here. If I want to be a professional bluegrass musician, I felt like I had to take a very like strategic approach, just trying to get rid of the barriers and, and figure out what those barriers were. The feelings still come and I have to reckon with that, but I think I have better ways of moving forward and not being stuck, which I think was the killer for me. Catch all that and so much more on the new season of Inside the Musician's Brain.